What I want to talk to you today is, uh, I'm going to give you, you know, five minutes of history because some of it's very interesting and I think you'll be surprised. Kind of the roots of where Zoom's were. And then we're going to get kind of about 100 years and just go and look at the future. Um, but there are a couple of key things that I'd like you to think about. One is um, traditionally you think about zoos as being a place where people go and see exotic things. And uh, everybody, I think, knows the term by Ophelia E.O. Wilson's term, the human love of nature. Um, so that kind of explained it. But the, the question really is can we get to a point where zoos are really sanctuaries, not just in name, but uh, in reality? And where they're centered on the patient. I, I don't mean to imply that zoo animals are sick. Obviously, most of them are not. But where really the focus is on what's best for the animal. Uh, and then find uh, creative new ways for the public to be able to experience that without compromising animal welfare. Um, and then secondly, um, there are lots of people who are very critical of zoos. And I guess the question is, could we, I'm not reading my phone, I'm trying to control this. Um, could we actually get to a point where zoos are even better than they are, uh, animals' lives are even better than they are in the wild? Okay, well, this one's working in the country. So, um, <clears throat> how do we fit into nature? And zoos are one of the ways that you kind of get an answer in different cultures. Historically, it's been, you know, we've been capturing them. Of course, people eat animals and do other things with them. Zoos have often been accused of being centers of confinement and cruelty. Uh, but also, I think you know there's a lot of science that now goes on uh, and uh, conservation work. And there's also a lot of rescue. Um, <clears throat> the picture you see below. It, it's not a chimpanzee, but, but a text, which I know you can't read about the gorilla, is really kind of interesting. This is 100 years ago, the New York Zoological Society. And it basically says, you know, if you hear that the uh, zoo has got gorillas, you need to come right away, because they don't live very long in the zoo. They, they generally die very quickly of indigestion and solidness and various other things. So, you know, there's kind of a weird history here where this was really focused on, um, on just seeing exotic things and, and with no thought to what's best. Um, I don't know if any of you know where the term Bethlehem comes from, but it comes from the Royal Bethlehem Hospital, which is a hospital in England. Um, not really a hospital, but really an insane asylum. And I'm telling you this because for hundreds of years, before zoos were open to the public, this is what people in London did for fun. They would go to, oops, they would go to this place, they would pay a little bit of money, and they would walk the halls and see all of the, the weird, crazy, Things often that were shackled to the walls, and you could pay extra to get them alcohol, and they'd be even more bizarre. But it was essentially a freak show. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence. This, this opened up in the 12th century, the 13th century, and it closed to the public in the mid 1800s, which is when the London Zoo opened. So we kind of look back and, and to put it crassly, we switched from one freak show to another. Um, and that, but that was a couple of hundred years ago. So obviously a lot has changed, right? Well, circuses have been around for a long time. And that was another fairly recent announcement. I think you probably heard that Rosen Brothers said they're going to take their elephants off the, uh, the road. Um, not clear why it's taken years to do that. Um, and some of you may know that we stopped uh, holding elephants uh, boy, about years ago. Um, 
And we did it because we just didn't think that elephants would thrive. And, and our big starting point is that if an animal can't thrive in the captive environment, not simply survive, but thrive, there's no ethical foundation to keep it. So circuits have been going on for a couple hundred years and haven't changed a whole lot. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. This is zoos of 50 years ago. Uh, the one on the left, by the way, is the Detroit Zoo. There was a chimp show there that was quite famous um, and very dramatic and huge crowds. Uh, I still have in my office the whip that was used to train the animals. Of course, the public didn't know that, didn't see that, but um, and no, I wasn't there 50 years ago, but uh, it is, it's pretty amazing that it's not that, I mean, I'm sure to college students 50 years seems like an enormous amount of time, but this show didn't stop until about 30 years ago. Um, and there are still, uh, and, and you see the kind of enclosure that animals used to be kept in. Now, one of the things to think about, I know some of you are veterinary students, uh, I want you to think about this. A lot of zoo design for decades was done like this polar bear exhibit, was done in a very unnatural way for uh, a good intention. And the intention was this is the way we can keep an, an area clean, because we can hose it down, clean it and everything. But of course what wasn't being considered was how this was experienced by polar bear. So you don't see this now very often, but you still see um, you still see this kind of exhibit where you see a monkey and doesn't that look cool? You know, that's a tiny, tiny space with a mural that's been painted to look like the jungle. Is there anyone here who thinks that the monkey looks at that wall and goes, oh my god, I'm in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, um, the theatrical part of zoos and clinics, which can be a wonderful thing, isn't always what it appears, and isn't always something that actually adds value both to people and to animals. And that's something that we need to continue to change. We need to continue to be a little bit more transparent, a little bit more honest about what's going on. And this is still going on. So I mentioned the orcas. Uh, there are many places that still have orcas around the world and have shows. Uh, there are many places that still have elephants and new elephant shows. So it is part of our, our past, but it's also still happening. Okay, um, I'm going to show you some more interesting pictures, but I want to go through some important uh, issues first. So I, I think the key is that anybody that is thinking about a zoo should be asking the question. And that should start with those of us who work in zoos and aquariums. Um, is this a real depiction of nature or, or is it frankly nonsense? And, and I think we have to be able to demonstrate that it's not nonsense, that it is real. Um, but this is the area where things like conservation and welfare and education and entertainment, they all kind of collide together. And the question is, can it work on all fronts? And I think that's the real challenge for us. So first of all, uh, you all are in a university uh, setting. Uh, we all are very passionate about science, as we should be. Um, we need to put a big dose of compassion and common sense into the equation. And that's not always been the case. In fact, I would throw, even though this is slightly to the side on this issue, uh, as a zoologist, I remember for decades watching fellow zoologists or taxonomists go out and collect animals in the name of science. And, you know, the idea is go catch an animal, kill it, put it in a bottle. There's an ethical question mark about is this the way to advance science? Uh, and that still happens to some extent. In any event, the other thing that's absolutely essential when we saw the polar bear in an impoverished environment, we've got to understand the natural history of whatever species uh, we were working with. We need to remember that just as with humans, each one of us is individual, we all have different preferences, we're all different personalities. The same is true for animals. And this is something which kind of gets lost and it's really surprising because 
um, I think a long time ago, a lot of scientists demonstrated that animals are not biological robots. So recently, uh, there was a study done on sheep facial recognition. And I, every time I read one of these new studies, I always go, wow, and then I go, why did I say that? Why would I think that sheep wouldn't be able to differentiate between dozens or hundreds of other sheep simply by looking at them? How do you survive in nature if you can't discriminate between individuals? You can't distinguish who's who. So we need to stop thinking that we're so different. Um, and we need to make sure that we not only understand their natural history, but that we really understand their sensory ecology. So in the zoo environment, for instance, if you're cleaning an area and the animals nearby, those cleaning solutions can be really noxious, obnoxious. When you think about it, most mammals have far greater olfactory acuity than we do. So this is the kind of sensitivity uh, that uh, needs to really be applied. The other thing is, um, at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. This is where common sense comes in as well. In order for any animal, non-human or human animal, to thrive, they need to be in an optimal physical and social environment. And so, a polar bear living in a tropical area obviously is not in an appropriate physical environment, and indeed they do not thrive. And indeed, that's how things used to be. Um, and that was part of the element discussion. The other thing that's really essential, and you think about this in your own life, imagine if you had essentially no control and no choice on a daily basis in your life. Remember what it was like to live at home when your parents said, I'm in charge, not you? Uh, so imagine if you're living in a captive environment, even if, and it's true that those of us who work in zoos and aquariums are incredibly benevolent, but still, we are making the vast majority of choices for the animals. We decide who you live with, who you get to have sex with, what you eat. Um, and I could ask one of you what your favorite food is, and because we're in Boston, someone's going to say lobster. Uh, and so I'm going to go, okay, I'm really benevolent. Lobster now. Every meal for the rest of your life, because I know that's your favorite. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, guess what? Same applies. So we got to think about nutrition, but we also have to think about choice and preferences and, and things like that. Uh, it's, it's been demonstrated even in rats. It, they prefer to have choice over their favorite food. It's not a surprise. It's common sense, and we need to apply more of that. Um, I think the other thing is we obviously to get to a point where if it's a great zoo, an ethical zoo, you really want to be able to demonstrate that you're advancing conservation uh, in a very meaningful way, uh, both for species and ecosystems. And I'm going to give you examples of all of these things so that you'll see it. Uh, and, and then finally, advancing environmental and humane education. Um, we sometimes are called activists, which is not something normally that you hear in the zoo world. Um, and it's because we really believe that things are important, so we take on stuff. Um, there's wolf hunting, a trophy hunting going on in the United States, in a number of different states. So we said, okay, we've got to talk to the public about this. We have 1.4 million people a year. We need to educate them. And the first way to do that is to build something fabulous. You'll see a picture of it in a minute. Uh, and then engage the public and explain to them the issues. Americans were outraged when they heard about sea silver wine as a, as a trophy hunt. Yet, we are not in the States. It's just really bizarre. So, we have to really affect people's attitudes and that nature. And uh, so, let me show you how one zoo is trying to do that. Uh, that's in, in uh, well, it's not in Detroit, we're actually north of Detroit. This is the center of our zoo. Um, this is a walkway. Uh, all of this is through uh, Michigan wetlands, and we think it's not just important to talk about animals from other places, but also animals where we live. Uh, and I'm happy to say that that walkway is made out of all of the bottle caps that you are using right now on your water bottle. Uh, it's all recycled. Uh, this is the largest and most unique polar bear facility in the world. 
Uh, this is four acres. Again, it sounds like a lot. It's huge for a new exhibit. We think it's probably the smallest you can possibly do and still have polar bears thrive. Uh, and uh, we're, this has now been open for 14 years. We're still waiting for somebody to make bigger ones, but it's obviously very expensive to do that. I mentioned the wolves. So we opened a, a multi-acre facility for our wolves so that we would have both legal standing to talk about the wolf hunt issue, but also uh, to really let people understand that the big bad wolf is not a big bad wolf. It's an awesome dog. <laughs> <laughs> and if I were to tell you, and you won't believe the statistic, in the past 100 years in the United States, we think, we're not even positive of this, we think there is evidence that two people in the past 100 years, two people have been killed by wolves. Your chance of being killed by a cockroach is probably a thousand times greater. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And that is, that's the argument that's being used. So here's another thing that we think is kind of important, and I was very excited when we opened this at the Wall Street Journal called the Disneyland for Toes. Um, this is the National Amphibian Conservation Center. Uh, we have about 100 species of amphibian here. All of them are endangered, some of them incredibly endangered. Uh, and about a thousand animals in there. And, and, uh, and this is kind of a new effort where mega million dollar investments are made not just for the charismatic megavertebrates, okay? not, not just for polar bears and gorillas and elephants, but for the things that are really important in nature, which are the greedy crawly things. Um, you know, there are lots of people who get incredibly enthusiastic about the giant pandas, and we actually refused to take giant pandas uh, last year. Um, it's probably the only, I think it's actually the only an alien species I can think of that if it goes extinct, other than disappointing us on an aesthetic level, it has zero impact on the environment. It'll be a little more mental in the world, <laughs> which would be good for red pandas. But, um, so that's not a reason to abandon the giant panda, but it is a reason to question where are we making more investments? And is it really for conservation or is it because we think something's pretty? So here's a different kind of beauty contest. So that's a cartula snail on the right. There were 25 of them left about 30 years ago. We took them all out of the wild in the Pacific. And now there are many, many thousands and they're being reintroduced back into the wild. Really annoying me that I don't get to take them back there because it's in Tahiti. Um, <laughs> It's all the zookeepers that get the cool time. Uh, but in any event, um, we spent millions on the snail. It's important for the ecosystem. Uh, the carnival butterfly on the left is being reintroduced into the wild in the Midwest uh, to our work. Up top, the Blanding's turtle that has a little radio tracking device on it. Here's another little tidbit that you'll like, and this is the application of science the application of this idea that animals are individuals, we are publishing now work. We've documented that turtles have personality. Different turtles, you can actually document some of them are shy, some of them are very aggressive, some of them are very social, some are not. I mean, it's, who knew? We should have assumed this. Instead of assuming that we're so different than everything else, but this is the kind of work that's really cool. Why is that so important aside from understanding more? Well, this means that this turtle, which is really endangered, the Lanning's turtle, when we release it, we release animals that we have documented appear to be bold. Because if they're not bold, they have almost no chance of surviving in the wild. So we get to use the science to then help with the conservation. I mentioned education is another important piece we created uh, many years ago an academy for human education. As far as I know, we're still the only two that's doing that. Uh, but inside it is also a humane science lab. When I was growing up and we studied biology, 
Now, every kid had to dissect a frog. Why? How many people dissecting frogs who obviously were not going into veterinary medicine or some other field? It was a terrible waste of life. So this lab teaches teachers and students how to learn about biology without current animals. Oh, I should have told you the other thing that we do. We part of the dog you see. Um, 20 years ago, we, we uh, created something with our colleagues in the animal welfare world, but meet your best friend in the zoo. For some of you, you might think a cat's your best friend, that's fine. I'm, I'm not denominational. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> since then, over 20,000 dogs and cats that otherwise would have been destroyed in this day, uh, because we do events twice a year with about 30 animal uh, welfare and animal control and animal shelter agencies, and we do these massive adoptions. People love the zoo. We're a magnet for people who care about animals. A lot of people don't want to go to shelters because it can be, you know, depressing. Uh, and so this is a good way to partner and to save a lot of lives. This is another thing that's really important. I think everybody knows it's really hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's, we're all the same species. How on earth must it be for um, an owl? for instance, to find as it's flying back to its nest that that tree is now gone and there's a building there. So we can talk about it, but what we do here is we have people experience it. So we have a motion-based cabin simulator that can take up to 30 people at a time. It moves up to two Gs in any direction, not quite IndyCar G-forces, but it's pretty cool. And you become an owl, you become a dolphin, uh, you become lots of different species so that you can you can understand better what the animals must experience uh, in the wild. It's really, really important to help people understand that. This is uh, at the entrance, this is the first big initiative we did about 20 years ago to try to start the conversation to interpret things rather than simply show things. Uh, and this is the only permanent fine art gallery in a, in a zoo in the world, and that top balcony area is filled with art from all over the world. A couple of pieces we commissioned, including the bullet elephant here, which we hope uh, provokes people to really think about what our relationship is like with some animals. Um, and uh, this is also where uh, there's an indoor butterfly garden, which you see on the right. Uh, and that's our little spice of the Garden of Eden. Um, it's quite magical. And the great thing about an experience like that is that when you walk in there without anyone saying anything, you know that nature is really beautiful because you, you can't really see it in this picture, but we have hundreds of butterflies in there, and it's just magical. And you also intuitively know it's fragile. So that's all you need to do. You need to see a tiger. If you know that nature is wonderful, therefore you care, and that it's fragile, we've done our job. This is science on a sphere. Uh, I really wanted to embed a video, but it was a little bit beyond my technical skill. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is how we would see Earth from about 2,000 miles away. Uh, so it appears to people when they're in this room as a hologram. It's a very, very large sphere that's moving. Uh, and we can show Earth and what happens. So first of all, for the people that like to refute climate change, it's really fun to watch them when we show a one minute, here's the ice on the planet in 1910. And then if you watch in one minute, it's going to 2010. You still want to argue? Climate change is real. So we're able to show climate change, we're able to show uh, migratory patterns of animals, we're able to show a lot of different dynamic things. This was created by NASA and NOAA, and uh, we think it's a really useful tool because it's hard for people to grasp some of these uh, concepts. 
So here are some of the, in order to do any of the work that we do, we have to partner. Um, and you'll, this is a tiny uh, representation of the partners that we work with. You'll notice one of them uh, in the lower left, PETA. When, whenever I start, usually whenever I start uh, lectures at universities or, or with uh, the zoo community, I would say, uh, I have to ask who's PETA. And if it's a crowd of two people, you often hear, <laughs> and, and I sort of go, you know, if people who work in zoos and aquariums don't define themselves as people for the ethical treatment of animals, who would? And those of us who do work in zoos and aquariums are. So ethics is not something to be afraid of. It's something that we've got to embrace, we've got to understand, and it's a moving target. Our values change. There's no question about it. But in any event, we partner with lots of different entities uh, for our work locally, nationally, internationally. And on the left, you see uh, a number, well, basically, except for the top uh, say, which I'll explain in a second, you'll see a number of places where we have concentrated efforts in terms of conservation and animal welfare. We've been working in China with the zoos there. And it's a very, very interesting assignment because we're very um, concerned about enabling uh, something that's bad to continue. There are some good things in Chinese zoos, um, and, but there are also some things that are really challenging that we're just not sure yet uh, whether we're going to perpetuate something or whether we're really going to change, and, and the jury is still out. Um, but of course, there's plenty to change in America, too. Uh, in any event, we do lots of programs, uh, the release of the Miami toads in, in Wyoming, most endangered U.S. amphibian. Uh, same thing in Puerto Rico with the Puerto Rican crested toad. We've got a huge initiative in the Amazon where we take uh, dozens of people every year and we go to villages and um, really develop community conservation programs. It's got incredible traction. Um, and on and on and on. We have a big project in Antarctica. Uh, I'm going back February 1st with about 65 people and with one of the world's authorities on um, penguins who's been doing research there for 40 years. We still have space, by the way, on the boat. <laughs> Only about 15,000 person, but um, <laughs> it's nothing for a student. Um, in any event, um, and we're doing work. We have a big project. I'm going to show you that in a second in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is a great one. And just recently, with um, the Humane Society, uh, we've been working in Nepal, which is a an amazing place. You know, we were talking about earlier the wolf hunting and Cecil the lion in Nepal. When I was there in April, uh, they told me there was a tiger that has now killed over a dozen people. The population wants no harm to come to that tiger, and the government wants no harm to come to that tiger. They want us, we were there for human wildlife conflict management, they want us to help figure out other solutions than killing the tiger. Can you imagine if we had that ethic here, what a different uh, place it would be? So we don't have a lock on, you know, the Sort of pinnacle of, of ethical treatment of animals in the United States. There are some other cultures that are ahead of us. So I, I mentioned the Congo. Um, this is a 24 acre area. We, there are 14 growers gorillas there. I doubt that you've ever heard of something called the growers gorillas. You've heard of mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas. These live near the mountain gorillas. They actually have overlapping ranges, but there are only a couple of thousand. We're not sure of the exact number, but very, very few left in the wild. Uh, we, with our partners, Disney and, and the Bossy Fund and a few other zoological societies, established this orphanage. We have 14 now young gorillas that were confiscated and were all on their way to a terrible fate, um, and their parents were all killed in order to catch them. Uh, and then these are going to be released uh, into the rodents. Uh, and in fact, in uh, January, I made with um, uh, the head of the rangers and the rodents for trying to work out the details. 
Um, but this is a, a really phenomenal project that was started by uh, Action Philosophy and then we did it on. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this because there isn't time, but these are some of the milestones for us on our path to um, getting towards a more ethical uh, zoo. I'm, I'm not prepared to call it an even yet, but um, and I'll just note a couple of things we've been doing a lot of rescue work. You see a lot of pictures here. The polar bear on the right, era was in a part of the Mexican circus on tour in Puerto Rico. Can you imagine a polar bear in Puerto Rico? Um, and fortunately, with our friends at PETA and Nature's US and some others, we were able to get her and uh, six other polar bears out. Um, the bear next to her, his hand, he was a mascot for a beer company. I don't know if you know the name of that beer company, but you can guess based on the name of the bear. Um, when he got too old, he was sold, and it was legal to own him. And uh, ultimately, he ended up on somebody's um, land and, as a pet, chained, and neighbors came over and used to torment him, hit him with baseball bats, and ultimately pitchforked him in the face. Um, fortunately, they were able to get him out, and, and we were asked to take him, and we did. Uh, this is one of the racehorses we have. Uh, did you know that about half of the racehorses every year in the United States are destroyed? Um, if you don't win, it means you don't make money, and so you're not needed. So we thought it was important to have them at the zoo so we could also talk about that issue and the need to be responsible about that. Uh, and you see uh, one of our junkyard lions. We, we have crack house lions, we have junkyard lions. This is one of them that came from a Kansas junkyard. Uh, but in any event, a lot of rescues and the biggest one in history, which again, we worked with PETA on, um, and that was over 20,000 animals that were warehoused in Texas a few years ago. Most of them small exotics, but it's just really incredible. Um, so we also do a lot of uh, other things. One of them is we created a center for animal welfare, for some animal welfare. I want to make sure I leave a few minutes for questions here, so I'm going to visit to this last piece. Um, here you see the key things that we do for the Center for Zoo Animal Welfare. Um, obviously we do science, but, but we also make sure that we are a place to convene experts and also where if you want to find out something about animal welfare and exotic animals, you can find it here. We've done all the work for you. It's all in one place. We also give out awards uh, and do workshops. Um, so this was one of the, uh, this is what we do with the symposia, and uh, we have people from all over the world come and participate. Here's a workshop. These are zoo professionals, the people who care for animals, and we're, we're making them experience the world as a work <laughs> Um And we also have um, exercises where they become a drag, so we put them up way high and, uh, you know, it just changes, getting you to change your perception. We are, we are tracked. We're tracked with human perceptions. Our senses are, are different, but similar, uh, to a lot of other animals, and we have to try to experience the world the way they do. Uh, and as I mentioned, we also do science, so these are the last couple of slides. Uh, we do a lot of assessments of animal welfare. Uh, obviously, we do it at our own institution, but for instance, in China, we spend a couple of weeks uh, working with the three largest zoos, assessing their welfare, and then trying to train the staff. Uh, this is measuring cortisol um, and in lions before we move them into a new habitat and during construction. Uh, this is we rescued three grizzly bear cubs. Their mother had been shot in Alaska. Uh, and the cubs, this just before winter, and the cubs would not have survived, so that's the fishing game asked us to take them. We did, and then we started doing work uh, on ethograms and, and measuring uh, behavior. And this, I'm sure you can recognize, is a penguin. Uh, and you've been doing work. This is really cool stuff. I was at a UFA, uh, which is an animal welfare organization in England, a conference a couple of years ago, where I learned that using infrared thermography, 
We might be able to detect stress in horses from the change in the temperature of the pupil of the eye, uh, which if you think about the autonomic nervous system actually kind of makes sense. So we have started uh, trying to use infrared thermography uh, to see whether we can use it as a non-invasive tool to measure stress. In penguins and many other things, um, this was all done at the zoo. I tried doing this the last time I was in Antarctica, and it was really hard to do it in the field. Um, so sometimes you actually can do work that you can't do in the field, and that work can be validated. Um, and then this is the last thing I'm showing you, uh, which is just kind of what's next. This will be open in a few months. The largest uh, penguin conservation center in the world. Um, and this is in part because of the work that we've been doing in Antarctica for a number of years. Uh, this is going to be quite spectacular because you have to cross Great Passage. And um, I don't know, has anyone been to Antarctica? So the Great Passage is the body of water that is at the very southern tip of South America. And it's where the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Southern Ocean, which is going in a completely different direction, all three are going in a different direction, they all converge. It's insane. Uh, and often 50 foot waves or hundreds of miles. So no wonder many ships are lost and it's a tough place to get to. We, of course, want our visitors to experience that. So we've created some theatrics that will do that, uh, but also people will be uh, 25 feet underwater uh, with penguins all around them underneath them, around them, in, uh, in an acrylic environment. That was the ship. That, that's a picture taken from our zodiac of the ship inside of an iceberg. Uh, Antarctica is a, a Star Trek experience. It's like going to another planet. Um, I'm going to end there because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, but I hope that uh, you'll take from this that, A, we've got to be really serious. This is you know, we can have a ton of fun going to a zoo and aquarium, but it's really essential for us to go to the great place and live there. Otherwise, our moral standing about all the conservation work that's being done is on shaky ground. Um, so, let me field any questions or comments. Yes? Um, I, I think zoos are a very good problem. I've people so I'm not sure everyone heard your question, but I can't. Um, the, the question is, you know, aside from focusing on the things that people, you know, want to see, like tigers, the, the charismatic stuff. Um, do we take on other issues? So one of the issues that you referenced was exotic pets. And zoos do. There is, ACA has been very vocal about this uh, for quite some time. Uh, and we are constantly battling ACA as a whole, not just us. Um, this trend in, in the U.S. of, you know, there are far more tigers in private hands in the U.S. than there are in zoos. In fact, there are far more tigers in the U.S. in private hands than there are in the wild. Uh, so this is a huge problem. Uh, and it is not being addressed federally. It's, it's being done on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, so yes, students do do that. I, I think, though, your question is a really good one because I think it, the real point here is that students have a responsibility and an opportunity to be the voice for the public to understand important issues. And that is one of them. Uh, there have been some great films on this, but uh, that's one of the really big ones. But the amphibian center that I showed you was almost a $10 million investment. And a lot of people thought we were nuts. Uh, fortunately, we knew that butt were smarter than the critics. And butt lines are way back when, and remember these frogs and their advertisements. We know that if we're creative enough, we can get the public to get excited about anything, including frogs or snakes. So we just have to be more creative. Yes? Um, well, the polar bears uh, are important in the ecosystem because they're predators. They're apex predators. The giant panda is not. Now, 
I don't want to. I don't want to imply that this animal is more important than that animal. It's more important than that animal. But there are a few animals where if they disappear, nothing else happens in an ecosystem. That's not the case with predators. If predators disappear, for instance, on um, Isle Royal, uh, there's a big debate going on. There are three wolves left. They are the only apex predator on that island, and there are hundreds, actually over a thousand moose, I think. When all the wolves um, die out, which is inevitable now, since they still won't let us move wolves there, the moose will destroy that island. They'll, they'll eat all the vegetation, which will then destroy habitat for everything else, and then all the moose will crash. So, when you're talking about polar bears or other predators, there is a cost in an ecosystem to losing a predator. Yes? Well, I'm not a spokesperson for PETA, obviously. I, I, my experience with PETA, which goes back a long way, <laughs> is I don't agree with everything, and I don't think they agree with everything that we do, but I think they are absolutely for what is good for animals and what is good for the relationship between people and animals. And that's exactly how I feel, and I would hope that all of us would want that. So, um, I'm for the abolition of bad zoos, and my God, there are a lot of bad zoos. You know, those are not the accredited zoos in the United States, but there are thousands of roadside zoos, pseudo sanctuaries that are horrible, and we're constantly rescuing animals, and many others are in those places. So, I think, you know, my, my take on on PETA is that it's um, often marginalized as extremist. And uh, and I think that's unfortunate because the foundation, as I said, should be we should all be people for the ethical treatment of animals. Yes. I was um sorry, I was your and I was wondering if you're going to find me for a matter of those you have uh tunnels of people in your life and for polar bear and that for um, that's kind of like where the dwelling is on that person. That's the people in the contained area, yeah. Um, yeah, it's complicated for a number of reasons. Um, it, the answer is yes, we are, wherever we can, we're trying to do that. Um, but then you, you can have extraordinary expense. I mean, the acrylic piece. Uh, for polar bears, the acrylic stuff for the Penguin Center is massively expensive. So a, a better way of making sure that animals had a great experience and that people can get relatively close but not close enough to disturb them is the layout. And this isn't a design class for creativists, but you can create a 10-acre habitat as long as it's rectangular more or less, so that if, if you're prepared to walk, you will ultimately find where the animals are. That gives the animals plenty of space and plenty of, of choice, but it doesn't cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do. The other thing is for any time you do anything out of glass or acrylic that's land-based, you don't have to then clean it in a way that becomes almost impossible operationally. So there are some technical challenges and financial challenges to doing some of those things with terrestrial animals. I think this is going to be the last question. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, in terms of education, do you ever think that the education system is not being taught to the public? So. When Alan introduced me, he talked about compassion conservation. This is an emerging field we're player in. Um, and this is one of the one of many issues that needs to be uh, really discussed. Every time there is a, a
program to release animals into the wild, there are all sorts of potential consequences. First of all, whether the animals survive or not, but you know, the black-footed ferret was released, everybody was really excited, except that you were a prairie dog in that habitat, you were not excited. <laughs> so we're picking winners and choosers. We're also um, running some real risks with wildlife disease and whether animals are um, prepared for that sort of thing. So in the conservation arena, that's a very big topic. Um, generally, zoo environments are so isolated and quarantined that you don't have infectious uh, issues. Um, but for, for conservation programs, that's becoming more and more of an issue. And of course, with avian flu now, um, we do have migratory birds coming in and that, so all of us, all, all of the zoos have taken various measures, moving certain animals uh, indoors where we didn't have them before, and that's the last place we want to put animals is indoors.